Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm DJ Sixsmith. You're watching the sit down. Leslie Linka Gladder is here with us. Homeland coming to an end. Leslie, how are you? I am good. How are you? As good as can be expected for all of us in these crazy times. Yeah, I'm right there with you. It's a weird time, but I've been telling people plenty of time to catch up on good shows. And your show is at the top of the list for me and for a lot of people. It's been incredible. So when you think about the journey of Homeland, it's taken you know almost a decade of your life. What have been some of the crazier moments for you overall? Well, I think you only get a few of these in a career where you have amazing stories. Uh, you have the idea that you want to be in the room with the smartest people and not be the smartest person in the room. Uh, and that we have these amazing, complicated, layered characters, you know, at the heart of it. And I think every year we've reinvented the wheel. We've gone to a different country. We've started over again. And I think it's kept the storytelling very alive and very fresh, as well as we meet with the intelligence community before every season starts. And uh, the creator of the show, Alex Ganza, always starts off asking, what's your biggest fear? What keeps you up at night? And that's where the season comes from. Yeah, it's certainly a good question to start with. And I feel like Carrie Matheson is a great character to start with. When you think about her progression, I mean, unlike any character maybe ever in the history of television, what is most fascinating to you about Carrie as a character? Uh, Carrie Matheson to me is a game changer female character. She is layered and complicated and not one note in any way. She, uh, she doesn't always do the right thing. In fact, she's often dipping into areas that are extremely difficult, but she is always compelling and she is always dedicated to mission. Yeah, and she can she could be a vulnerable person and you know she can slip up along the way and, and sex plays a role in that too and mental health and it's like all these different health. things showing yes. that she's fallible and she can also be extraordinary at her job. Yes. And she is all of those things, and I think she is as layered and complicated as any male character. Mm -hmm. But certainly when this started 10 years ago, there were not a lot of female characters like this. She's she's pretty iconic. She's yeah. a badass. <laughs> I totally agree with that. You mentioned how you guys have been all over the world. You started over the show in a lot of different ways. What do you think is the most ambitious thing that you've been able to do? Like you've killed off characters, you've gone to all these different places. Like <laughs> what is the most insane thing that you guys tried and you're like, oh wow, this actually worked out really well? Well, I think there have been a few of those. You know, I think the fact that it is quite unusual to reset a show every year. I mean, usually by the time you're on season eight, you got it dialed in. You know, you're on the same sets, you're with the same crew, you kind of go back and pick up where you left off. Well, we never do that. You know, it never got easier because we're always beginning again. But as a result of that, it always stayed exciting. So that's the good news. This past year was really difficult. Mm -hmm. you know? And we were nine months in Morocco, which is a wonderfully hospitable country, but it is also a, a third world country. So there were all sorts of things about shooting there that were challenging. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and also that's exciting too. It offers opportunity, but it was definitely, it was definitely the most challenging season, you know. And obviously this year we bring everything story-wise back around full circle, which I love. Hmm. Well, Have you seen the finale yet? No, I haven't seen the finale yet. I'm, I think I'm one behind. So I got to watch the second to last one and then I got to watch the finale. Okay. Yeah. But I, I've been I've been digging it this year for sure, and it's funny because like my family was in on Homeland from the beginning, and I was kind of in that like twenty four haze where I I love twenty four and kind of yes. needed some space from that. And your show is so different from twenty four, and it was pretty clear off the bat. But yeah, once I got into it, I like crazily binge watched it for like six months, and it was an amazing binge watch. So what's it been like for you to kind of have people jumping in at all these different points from when you guys were first on Showtime in twenty twelve to now a binging world where people can watch it whenever. Well, I think now, obviously, you know, watching, viewing habits are so completely different. Forget about our pandemic life, but, you know, people like starting and watching the whole thing rather than the week in between. And I think there's something to be said for both of those, quite honestly. You know, I certainly love starting something and seeing the whole thing, but there is something about the buildup 
to the next week that also, you know, is, is an interesting one, you know? Um, so I think both, both play a different role in our viewing habits. I mean, what's happened in television in the past 10 years is extraordinary. You know, in terms of what we expect from watching TV, you know, we, it has to be as, as visual as any film. I want to ask you also about some of the other projects that you've worked on, because you mentioned now Homeland is, you know, a, a once in a lifetime opportunity, but you got to yeah. direct some of the Mad Men episodes. And that's another show that really transformed TV. What was the coolest part of that experience for you? Oh, well, you know, I feel like I've been really lucky and I'm very grateful for that. I love being a storyteller, you know, and I love this process of working with other creative artists to tell that story. And Mad Men, to me, looked at how America got to where we are right now. You know, it was going back in the past to see where we are in the present. And again, look at Don Draper as a character, you know, layered, complicated. I mean, he does horrible things and you still love him. You're still with him. So I think, you know, he's a pretty iconic male character. And you see how we went from kind of the 50s male into the 60s, how, how we transformed as a culture and how, how women are viewed. Yeah, no question about it. How about the West Wing? Because that was incredibly popular when it was on TV. And it sometimes even gets lost in the shuffle when mentioning the greatest shows. But what sticks out in your memory about that experience? West Wing, oh my goodness, the writing on West Wing, the cast, it really felt like you were able to go into the back rooms of power and see how decisions were made. And, you know, you have kind of an aspirational group of, of characters where you really are in the room with the smartest people. And the level of discourse is so intelligent and profound. And of course, the actors demanded that of themselves and everyone circling it, you know. And, you know, Aaron Sorkin's writing is extraordinary. Uh, so it felt like being kind of at the cutting edge of uh, politics and character. And that's what I love in storytelling. I love big sweeping political stories that have an impact, like kind of a macro view and juxtapose with the, the powerful interpersonal stories and how those interface with each other. So it's interesting you say that because, you know, cutting a different way, like you did Gilmore Girls, for example, and that's I did like the pilot. completely different, right? And like, just tell me about jumping in that world because it's like, it's really witty banter and people who now watch The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel like know exactly what that's all about. So what do you remember Absolutely. about that? Absolutely, Amy Sherman Palladino, man. Uh, yes, I directed the pilot of The Gilmore Girls. And, you know, one of the things I loved about working in TV is you can tell all different kinds of stories. You know, you don't have to be, as a director, pigeonholed into one specific genre. So I loved telling a mother-daughter story, you know, and the complications in that relationship. And I, I loved Amy's, you know, fast repartee dialogue, where again, everyone is really, really smart. But it dealt with some very true a uh, uh, emotional reality between mothers and daughters. And that just hadn't been done in that way. And it was amazing to do. Yeah, and then over a decade later, you're telling the story of Carrie and Franny and that mother-daughter relationship and the same sort of things are going on there, just in a much more intensified way. Absolutely. And, you know, again, to me, one of the great things, uh, a kind of a classic homeland scene, is when two characters have completely opposing views and they're both right. So it makes you look at the whole situation and question, maybe not have answers. And, and also that no one in Homeland is wearing a black hat or a white hat. Everyone is very much in the world of gray. You know? And I kind of feel like that's where we are right now. I mean, this season, we're looking at, you know, what has America learned since 9-11? And if there was, God forbid, another 9-11, we're kind of living through that right now. What have we learned? Would we overreact again? Would we take our time and get all the information and get all the experts so we are making the best possible decisions? And in Homeland, what happens if your leader happens to not be up to the task? 
Yeah, and how much emotion plays a factor in all of this and how we repeat the same exact things even when you think we've learned from stuff and in truth, we haven't. Yes. And in terms of the, the personal story between Carrie, Carrie as a mother, Carrie and Franny, you know, I thought that was one of the riskier storylines that we looked at because of everything you are supposed, a woman is supposed to be a good mother. And it is just not acceptable if a woman is not a good mother. And the fact that last season we looked at the fact, as much as Carrie loves her daughter, she is not actually the best person to raise her daughter. You know, That's she really heard it sometimes. It is a hard thing to look at and be honest about. And she fought it. And then she realized, oh my God, my sister at this point is the better person to raise my child. You know, what risky material to deal with. Yeah, uh, even in this time and in day, it's really fascinating. And I, I think Homeland has has constantly pushed boundaries and you know bring this thing full circle. It's coming to the end now. What do you want people to be thinking about when they check out the finale on Sunday? Uh, I'm really, I mean, finales, series finales are you know so tricky, and there was so much dialogue back and forth. The last twenty pages. We didn't get them till so close to when we were shooting. There was so much conversation around it. And I have to say, you know, I shouldn't say anything, but I, I feel like I'm really happy with how we ended the series because I do think it comes around full circle in a way. And I think at the heart of that story is the relationship between Solm Berenson and Carrie Matheson and that you know, father, daughter, mentor, student relationship, and uh, all the layers of that dedication to mission, where you compromise, where you don't. I think uh, it's a very full circle story. And I hopefully people, you know, the series makes people ask questions. You know, I know people tell me it makes them feel nervous from beginning to end, you know. (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah, there's so many anxious moments in this show that that is a part of the whole deal and a part of yeah. the story. And it's been an awesome ride. And Leslie, really appreciate you jumping on. Thanks so much. And uh, oh, thank yeah. you, thank you. Great to talk to you. And you have to let me know what you think of the ending. I will. Thanks so much. 